Welcome to Strength, Stability, Stiffness. In today's video, we're going to be talking about a common physics problem, which is often misunderstood and still appears in many textbooks incorrectly. The Tacoma Narrows, Galloping Gertie, and the cause of the actual disaster that occurred due to, well, let's get into it. Galloping Gertie was a bridge built across the Tacoma Narrows in the United States. Effectively, this was a very thin deck, relatively, suspension bridge. Suspension bridges work by having a large crane system with catenary wires hanging down, draped, and from those draping wires, which have very large blocks at the end to hold them in place, smaller vertical wires come down and hold the deck. These vertical wires are tension-only members. You can't actually put any compression in them. So if anything were ever to lift the deck up, they wouldn't resist it. It would lift free and clear. It would just come up. It is only able to hold the bridge deck from falling. So the bridge deck actually has to have a fair amount of stiffness to handle all of the vibratory effects that come from the, f the cars flowing across, cars and trucks passing across, vibrate, they deflect the deck. This can cause uh, situations where you can have uh, sets up of uh, frequencies and, and vibrations that will get larger and larger if they get close to a harmonic. For a very long time, this was understood as the problem that caused the bridge to collapse. Wind was held to have hit the natural frequency and made Galloping Gertie get more and more and more uh, vibrations or uh, repeating energies and start deflecting in these crazy modes. These are the ways in which structures behave. We call them modes. Let's take a look at the video. So it's interesting that they say 6 million because it actually turned out to be 6.4 million. They'd anticipated 8 million and reduced the cost somewhat prior. It's really interesting to see this with the cables being strung. So suspension bridges are actually, those main cables are produced by stringing together many, many strands of smaller steel cables. And this is exactly what's done even to this day. There are machines that string the individual cables across the river and uh, you bundle them together. You can see the, the safety precautions aren't exactly the greatest. There's a lot of uh, simple PPE, but not even mandatory. Here's a guy in a hat. Other guys in steel hard hats and just swinging on down the wires, wearing a little bit of anything in your pipe in your mouth. Uh, this would never be allowed now. Uh, we have a great deal of PPE, personal protective equipment, and it's actually the last line of defense. We try to eliminate all the risks first. So you can see how beautiful this bridge was at time of construction, and everybody wants their moment in the limelight. Uh, limelight's actually called limelight because prior to electric lights, they used to burn lime in order to have theatrical events at night and these sorts of things. That was one of the options that was possible. And the politicians, everybody, it's a great deal of money putting into a bridge, so it's quite a public event when they first open. Look how narrow that span is. That deck, that deck is so thin compared to most bridges, and that's where this comes from. So they actually knew a lot more about this than people seem to give them credit for. Washington State University did a lot of studies as to what was happening, and they decided on a couple of different possibilities. They were either going to punch holes in the sides of the deck so that it would catch less wind, or uh, put fairings to sort of like a wing uh, to deflect more air around it so it would have less of the, the causal factor involved here. Here's that's actually the professor's car right before the collapse. Uh, five days after they've had their final report and decided how they were going to try to fix this, they were going to put those little wing uh, gussets on the sides, the fairings to deflect the air, it collapsed, so they never got the chance. Uh, there were several techniques they tried to fix. They tried to actually uh, anchor the deck to the shoreline, but the cables just snapped. The forces were so great. And uh, basically nothing they were doing worked. They had a hydraulic ram system that was supposed to calm the deck, but they damaged it while painting the bridge. In the process of sandblasting and painting the bridge, they destroyed the system and it never worked. So it's a very unfortunate. They, they did understand a lot about what was going wrong and why, but they never managed to make it happen in time. There's the professor trying to get to his car to encourage the dog to come. He's calling to his pup, and the dog never comes. And very shortly thereafter, we'll see like, this, this is so famous. People would go, travel to go see the bridge. They would travel for long, long distances to actually just to go across this bridge. There's the professor after having failed to manage to get his dog to follow him. And it wasn't very much longer after this was filmed that the bridge actually went down. So we'll watch that now in a moment or two. And there it begins to actually actively fail and come apart. 
It's quite shocking when you see this video. Think about the forces involved. This is absolutely maddening to think just how great these forces were. But this bridge was truly at the leading edge. It was too far ahead. Oftentimes we're told that engineering shouldn't be at the state of the art. It should be at the state of the profession. And there you go. There's the after effects. Quite shocking when you think about it. Clearly a bit of video taken from a dinghy or a boat on the river. You can see the swaying of the camera with the waves. There's the after effects. So you can see Galloping Gertie was definitely galloping. And uh, it's nice to know that the only fatality was actually a dog. And sadly, that was a civil engineering professor's dog. He was driving the car across uh, very close to the end of the disaster. And he even ran back and tried to save his dog. But the dog was so scared, it wouldn't listen to his master. And uh, the dog went down with the car. So it's a sad, sad thing to have happen. But there were no human fatalities. Though, I mean, I like to consider myself quite uh, an environmentalist. And I consider it quite tragic that nobody could just grab the dog and save the poor little guy. But in any case, uh, the bridge collapse occurred not because of harmonic resonance, not because of this idea that uh, once a bit of energy goes into the building or the bridge in this case, if it's close to the natural frequency, it can't get rid of it. It keeps building up and holds onto that energy more and more and more. That's simply not the case. There's been much more advanced research done into this, and it turns out that this was actually a function of vortex shedding. This is an aerodynamic problem where when the wind hit the bridge, it was able to ever so slightly tilt the bridge up. Once the bridge was tilting, that wind was pushing more on the bridge. Then as it came back down, it would gust and push against the other portion of the bridge. And this is where this harmonic started coming from. And there we go. Look at me. Oversimplifying and being overconfident, just like every engineer and physicist who's come before me trying to explain this to people. So I tell you what, why don't we do better? Let's go to a whiteboard and take a look. The cross section of the Tacoma Narrows Bridge looks roughly like this. It's an eye shape, much like a, a beam that we use in construction all the time. And what happens is the wind coming strikes the face of the beam, and generally it will also come around and out the backside. Now that means that there's a low pressure area. There's actually air back here that's quite turbulent. And this air is trying constantly to be pulled away. There will be laminar, which means still. There'll be laminar air, and then it'll slowly start getting pulled away and turbulent away the back. On the back side, this is generally speaking a negative pressure area. This is negative and this is positive. One of the things that people don't realize with Gertie, Galloping Gertie had an interesting gallop. The two towers, I think earlier in the video I called them cranes, but anyway, the two towers have these draped wires, big, massive, bundles of cable, which have all of these straight shot hung wires reaching down, supporting the deck. So effectively, you have tension only members, right? These wires can only take tension. They've got this thin deck I drew. That deck runs between the supports, constantly supported by these wires. In general, this is what the bridge was constructed of. Now, when Galloping Gertie galloped, it's not the video that you see quite famously. Galloping Gertie actually had a gallop that was mostly vertical like this. Galloping Gertie did kind of a classic deflection. She'd go up in the middle, and then she'd go down in the middle. And the opposite supports reverse. Imagine what you see in the video only instead of the two sides going up and down, they're actually going up and up. These are going up together, and then they're going down together. But they're doing it together. And Gertie's gallop is actually sort of this saddle. If you were to picture this as sort of an enormous horse saddle, that's a better way of seeing what's going on. That galloping Gertie is going up and down when you walk across or drive across. Now, that was Gertie's little trick, but it wasn't what happened at the time of collapse. 
What happened at the time of collapse was that Galloping Gertie suddenly shifted into a different mode. Earlier in the video, I've talked about how the shape changes, the modes of a bridge or building, and she started suddenly changing such that we had up on one side and down at the same time. So instead of our nice, convenient, pretty little picture of Galloping Gertie going in the same direction, whether up or down, we started having up on one side and down on the other. This is our critical change to her behavior. And if you look carefully in the video, you see that these wires, these wires we're talking about, these tension-only members don't seem to actually change very much. What changed, in my opinion, and from the research that people have done and all of the papers, and you know, some people say that there's some debate, but I, I don't know if that's very fair. Uh, the initial issue is vortex shedding. So when we talk about this turbulent flow I was talking about over here, that turbulent flow forms next to the laminar flow, but it inevitably starts getting bigger on one side than the other. So you'll wind up with a, a larger amount on the top than on the bottom. Every little bit of change can cause problems. You also get these sorts of uh, vortices forming inside the decks. You'll get a vort vortex that's uh, forming at one side and, and then coming smooth or transitioning out. And that then has a differential pressure on the deck. You'll wind up with higher pressures and lower pressures on opposite sides of the deck. And oftentimes you'll have the inverse underneath. You'll have the same thing happening, but inverse. So this then tends to put a torsion. It tends to push down. This positive pressure is pushing down. This negative pressure is pulling down. This negative pressure is pulling up. This negative pressure is pushing up. So you wind up with this effect where the whole thing starts trying to turn. As soon as that starts happening, you then have the entire environment changes. The deck is now at a slight angle. And you wind up with this effect occurring on a structure that is slightly different in shape. This change in shape creates another layer of dynamics, right? And you can see that that's more likely then going to form high pressure is the reverse. You're going to get more pressure over here and less in the lees, right? That the, the area that's no longer being touched. And then the, the, the bridge might sway back. It might snap back and go the other direction. There's a couple of interesting things here. Everybody argues about sort of four things. People talk about whether it was resonance. They talk about it being vortex shedding. They talk about the possibility of positive, and sometimes you hear negative, oscillation. And you also have people who talk about it being uh, a, a, a function of uh, aerodynamic flutter. And I'm going to tell you that I think it's actually a mix of them. I think what most likely happened was at some point in the bridge, uh, the behavior because of the wind in this 40 mile per hour, this is quite a gusting uh, wind, 40 mile per hour wind is, is significant. So we've suddenly got a 40 mile per hour wind. And that's quite significant. Even in a small breeze, we had this what I'd call a first mode effect. We talk about this uh, natural bumping down and then back up and down again. And then the other phase of it is Gertie going and reversing that. And she kind of goes the other way. This is just a simple bouncing up and down. And these were occurring under regular winds. But when we hit this 40 mile per hour wind, we started getting quite an aggressive change. And if you think about it, no two things are exactly alike. The two sides of the bridge aren't exactly alike. So if the bridge was always doing this sort of blue and red thing, let's talk about here at the middle. We'll cross, we'll take a look at it here. If this bridge was doing this all the time, we might have a situation where 
Uh, Gertie was high at times, so she's up here. And then low at times, coming down here. And drawing it this way, what I'm doing is I'm showing you that the neutral position might be somewhere in between. So where she would want to sit is maybe here. This is the center line of our problem. The nice neutral spot where, I, where I've actually drawn the deck. This is Gertie's center line. So if you can imagine the two sides not being perfectly the same, you might even get just this sort of behavior where all of a sudden it starts being slightly more on one side and slightly less on the other. And that would just get worse and worse as things go on. But for resonance to be the case, you need a steady state of periodicity for it to come close to hitting the natural frequency. This happens with periodic things. This happens with a really regular forcing, you know, constant, like a heartbeat or like a breaths when you're running. It would be very, very regular. That's not very realistic. I suspect that what happened is a combination of things. We've got a video coming up on forensics engineering, and one of the things that we'll present there is that it is almost never one thing. I suspect what really happened is this vortex shedding started the whole deal. So we got vortex shedding, with vortex shedding causing the bridge to turn a little bit in the two directions. We then wound up with an aerodynamic flutter. This is what happens when you wind up with uh, the angle of attack changing, much like a like a an airplane's wing. This red area would be an instance, an example of aerodynamic flutter, because when it gets hit now and it turns back, it, the top is right now more in the wind. When it snaps back, the bottom is going to be more in the wind, and you're going to get that coming back and forth and getting worse and worse and worse. And I suspect in the end, you really did have kind of a positive or negative feedback, a negative, uh, people talk about negative damping, where uh, any system naturally resists being excited. Sort of the, think of it this way, if you have a damping in a system, you have the wiggle between the screw and the things that it connects together or nails that are slightly loose, all these little spots where you can lose a little energy. In the video we watched with De Galloping Gertie, a perfect example of that would actually be where the cables, these big main cables we've talked about, these cables were seen to be bouncing around in their housing. That's actually a perfect example of damping, places where energy will be lost. So if I had to make my bet as to how Galloping Gertie went down, it is not one. Resonance does not have anything to do with it. That's out. And then, because again, the periodicity is missing. Then what's really hitting is we have a, a two transitioning to a four and finally getting into a three where these effects all work together to bring the bridge down. And hopefully that's a little bit more clear than my flippant, it's vortex shedding and then explaining a little bit of aerodynamic flutter without even really explaining it. Hope you've enjoyed this little brief interlude in our video and we can go back to watching me talk about it. Thanks for joining me in this little whiteboard moment. And that's actually a function of the stiffness of the bridge, not a function of the natural frequency. And that was discovered by looking at the natural frequency and trying to match it to the wind and it was just nowhere near the match. So it could not be the case when you see it in your high school and in some college and university level textbooks for physics, when it says that this is an example of harmonic resonance, like the reason why uh, soldiers must break step, they can't walk together, they can't march in step across a bridge, that's just not the case. And if your high school teacher told you that, or even your college professor, they're wrong. And there's the papers to prove that in the links. I hope you've enjoyed it. Good luck and uh, try to be respectful. Teachers and professors are generally generalists. They know a heck of a lot about a heck of a lot, but not everything about one subject. If a structural engineer has been working in a field for a long time, they might not know it. I happen to know about this one because I find it interesting. I've worked in bridge repair before, and it's a common story amongst people who deal with forensics and maintenance, that this is a misunderstanding that just keeps perpetuating. So now you're amongst the people who know better, and hopefully you're able to stay, out, stay safe out there and uh, still be respectful of your teachers. Today's bonus technical fact relates to vibrations. When you look at floor vibrations, one of the main problems is actually big things on the floor. You don't have 
help from the weight of the floor. You have help from the stiffness of the floor. So the classic problem these days is with very big homes with long span floors, we wind up with kitchen islands that have very heavy countertops. And what happens is when people step on the floor, that pushes the joists down, the floor down just a little tiny bit. That accelerates that mass of the large kitchen island down. And when the floor tries to come back up, the mass is still accelerating down. So the floor has to try and pick it back up and that cycle starts getting worse and worse. And that floor vibration, you get the that gets quite bad because of the mass. The mass, which has its own momentum that tries to keep moving. It's simple Newtonian physics and that's the whole explanation. The solution is stiffness, not mass.